Hello everyone, welcome to strategic management. Uh, this is the unit number one. And then we're gonna go through some basic concepts of strategic management and how it works. So let's go through it. So first of all, there's um, there's this video I would like you to watch uh, because in the end it will be much easier for you to understand the whole unit if you watch and see how uh, strategic management works in action, right? Many of the topics that we will be looking at will make a lot of sense. You can do it either way. You can either read first the material and then watch the video. Anyways, it will work very well for you because um, really this, this company is very unique. Um, they really seem to have a great strategic management, but in the end it was all a facade. So just, just look at it, okay? So today we're going to talk about these topics and let's go one by one, okay? So uh, first of all, Let's talk about some basic concepts. So, um, I'm gonna be using Tesla today. Tesla as that a electric car company to understand that. You're gonna use it a lot in, in in explaining this unit so that we can understand it well. So first of all, we have what strategic competitiveness. So first of all, um, we companies are are like human beings somehow, and they are trying to see who's the best. Right. So in this case, uh, we we they have a strategy to say, how am I going to show to the consumer I am the best? So they try to the, the, they try to set up a plan. That's a strategy where they're going to use anything that they have in order to be the most successful ones. However, the same companies as persons, they have very specific skills that uh, give them a competitive advantage. You say, for example, he, in my case, my competitive advantage is talking is not being good looking, right? So anyways, the same thing with companies. So um, what they are trying to do again is try to be competitive within a pool of competitors who are the ones. What I want to try to compete in, maybe I will try to compete with price. Like, for example, in the case of, uh, in the case of Daiso, I am trying to compete on being the cheapest and provide value for money, right? They're, and in their strategy, they need to understand uh, where they're going to set up their manufacturing uh, factories, their factories where they manufacture and uh, how they're going to keep that competitive advantage. For them, the competitive advantage is quality, well, quality products for affordable prices. And the moment that, for example, if if it happens that the production cost of Daiso starts to go much higher, what's gonna happen is that you don't wanna pay 10,000 won for a lousy product. You better buy another one. So if it's 2,000 won, you'll buy it. But if it's more than that, then no. So in this case, again, different companies have different competitive advantage. If we think, for example, of Louis Vuitton, their, their value proposition is quality handmade fashionable products and the moment that they start to be mainstream they lose that kind of fashionable thing right so anyways a all of these actions generate what is called above average returns is above average returns is generating more money as compared to what we're investing if we we have a good return on investment okay very good so now when we're thinking about competitive advantage and setting a very innovative strategy or set of actions like we did with Tesla, for example, Tesla had a lot of risk. What was the risk? That in the end, nobody wants to shift to an electric car. This was a very huge gamble initially from Elon Musk to think that really he could be able to do something. However, the strategy was good. I mean, in some ways, he had a lot of hiccups, but somehow he's he's managing it. So again, in this case, uh, what the proposition of these electric cars he have average returns, which means the promise of Elon Musk was invest in this electric car company, and I promise you that at least you'll get back what you invested a little bit more. And in maybe 20, 30 years, 10 times more. So in this case, that worked very well for, for them. No, it's in this case. So in this case, uh, he had a full set commitment, decision, and actions 
to set up, for example, very innovative set of cars, start to do the production of the batteries, start to set the, the Giga factory and many couple of factories around the world, start to convince governments also that uh, greener energies are much better. So in this case, it was a whole set of actions. Tesla didn't happen just because electric cars are cool. Think about it. Initially, nobody wants to have it because it's like, well, what if I run out of battery out of it? So he had a plan for it. We're going to set that list in America, the charging stations in every point of this and this and that and that and that. And also it was a strategy with a plan. It means I, I give you the car, but I give you the power too. So for me, it's a win-win situation. So anyways, what is the competitive landscape? So in this case, when we're talking about Tesla, we're talking about the competitive landscape as the car or the automotive industry. So in this case, um, it was it's very competitive. There's tons of cars out there. And you're talking about a small company, initially a small company, now, not, now it's not small anymore, trying to compete with the big giants. So if this case, if they had a good electric car, immediately General Motors or any other company could copy it and they had the resources to destroy him. But again, he had that part of innovation and that part of strategy to be and to set themselves apart from the competition by having this self-driving cars and so, etc. So again, uh, in the competitive landscape, he saw the economies of scale, meaning that once he started to produce those cars, in the future, they could be cheaper. Now they are expensive, but he has already developed a models that perhaps will be more affordable in the future as long as the industry starts to move forward. Okay, so now in this case, we can talk about hyper competition. Hyper competition is what's going on today. Nowadays, uh, uh, like I said, I mean, even, even, even when he already was successful in setting this Tesla company, here we see the case that uh, companies decided to also develop their own electrical cars. Other companies started to copy his model and whether you want it or not become competition. And again, that's hyper competition because there's many countries with a lot of uh, financial resources, with a lot of human resources that can develop similar technologies. So uh, technology, well, the technology companies are facing a lot of struggles because to remain competitive, they have to constantly innovate, constantly move, because there's always someone behind trying to copy what you're doing. And sometimes it's not even copying it, it's copying it and making it better. Like, for example, for the case of the Huawei phones, right? Initially, they were copying Samsung and nobody was worried about it. But now when you will look at them, they have superior phones sometimes with some functions that are way, way much better than a Samsung one. Okay, so very good. So in this case, uh, we, within the competitive landscape, we need to see, we need to read the global economy. How the economy is moving around so that we can place our products in the most efficient places and the, the, where, where it brings the most return. So here's, for example, the case of, again, the case of in the case of Tesla, they had a gigafactory in America. They understand that two countries that have an immense volume of consumers of cars are China and the US. So what was the second step of Elon Musk? And that was recently, just last year, they finished setting up the factory in China. And also they had the Giga factory in America. Two factories that read very well the market. If I want to cover the Asian market, I go to China. If I want to cover the American market, I go in America and I produce it there. So in this case, they read those markets very well. I wouldn't be surprised if later they also try to market the Indian market in another way, which was, well, I mean, they are, they are already there, but of course, inf the infrastructure of the countries is also important from them because they are ultimately they are electric cars, which in Korea, we're seeing more often the electric cars, right? So now uh, when we're talking about the competitive landscape and let's, let's, um, Let's move a little bit from Tesla. He, uh, companies uh, have to constantly innovate because technology is moving very quickly. And it's not only in terms of how you're going to serve the consumer, but it's also important on what the consumer knows nowadays. Nowadays, consumers know a lot. Why? Because they go to blogs. I mean, the digital marketing has a very strong effect on consumers. They understand, uh, they, um, they have reviews of the product, they read, 
um, reviews of the product in different places, blogs, etc. And they know before they buy it, they know all the information and they know what they want. So we cannot cheat any longer consumers on what is good or not. We, we cannot use cheap marketing anymore. We really have to be efficient. And that is where here strategic management is trying to do that. How can I make better a product and really uh, be up to the standards of what the market needs? Because again, uh, consumer knows, knows more and also they want their product faster and they want it here right now and across borders, which is now is possible. So anyway, so in this case, we talk about in this case, uh, we were talking about the, the technology diffusion, right? Which is technology is moving very, very quickly. Uh, we have industries that we have to be very quickly, like for example, the cell phone industry, one year is already too much because you have to have the latest product as quickly as possible, right? We have technology, these uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, when we have, for example, the case of the case of Netflix, it was a disruptive technology to the filming industry, and now they're trying to adapt to it. You know, they were saying like, what are cinemas gonna do with their cinemas? Yeah, people still like to go to cinemas, but I'm. I, I last time I asked many of you, when was the last time you went to the movies? Was there one student? It's been four years. You know, I just watch things at home. So in this case, we have to think of how cinemas are gonna cope with these changes, and that is part of the strategic management of saying, how am I gonna make sure that I don't go bankrupt, bankrupt as a cinema? This social changes are there. People don't go like, for example, in America. They call it the 80s and the 90s, the age of the malls. Everybody used to go to the mall, to the cinema, to the shops, but now no more because people buy things online, they watch things online, and there's no need to go to the mall. So how, like, for example, how companies like uh, J.C. Penney's, which was a departmental store, is able to cope with these changes. And this is where we need to think of how they're going to move electronically. This is a case of the Toys R Us, for example, Toys R Us, they bankrupted and they are coming with a new strategy, which is they are using more the stores as a showroom, but still you can buy the things online and they're trying to cope with the changes of technology, right? Very good. So uh, let's talk about the industrial organizational model of average returns means if you want to make more money, what do you have to do? So let's look at a little bit of this one. So we talk about, first of all, we need to read the external environment, which is the general environment in terms of the PESA, political, economical, social, technological, legal, and environmental. We're going to see that in unit number two. If I said it too quickly, don't worry about it. So generally what's happening in the country, we need to look at what's happening in the industry, for example, like Tesla, what's happening in other cars, what are they're selling, how are they doing, and how, I mean, the automotive industry and also at the electric car industry, what is going on. So second thing, we need to look at an attractive industry. We need to look at an industry that has uh, sufficient money, it means there's money to, 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 to get it from, no? Uh, that we can that we can get from the consumer sometimes in other classes i teach in there they they they, they come with very innovative ideas but there's no sufficiency of the market meaning oh i want to sell these things for the disabled people yeah there's enough disabled people but uh if we talk about non-disabled people then the market is 20 well, 1 billion times more Right, so we always have to talk about the sufficiency of the market, and that's an attractive industry. It, or market, it can be a market also sometimes. Probably the last time I had a friend that he's trying to bring uh, a flower to uh, Myanmar, and the, the market of flour for making bread is not developed at all. So in this case, it's a very attractive, not industry, but an attractive market. So uh, we need to formulate the strategy, we need to think how we're going to make sure that we use the resources that we have strategically, how we're going to move forward in order to really set to be the, the first ones. How we're going to use those assets, assets in terms of human resources, in money, or put it all together and then throw it to the industry and be successful, right? So that goes together with uh, like that strategy formulation and planning of the, of the assets that we have. We put them all in together, we develop the strategy, and we have to measure it. So we have to see 
what we need to change, what works, what doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, based on that, then we have to uh, see whether we have superior returns. In the case of Tesla, for example, that I, they, they, they were able to read this, this uh, uh, all of this, the, all of this model, they read it very well, but for them happened a very big issue that they were not able to cope with the orders of cars because they have an over demand and they couldn't cope with the supply. So again, in this case, the assets that they have, the physical assets in terms of the company, they, they, they didn't have them. Okay, so in this case, we have um, uh, some underlying assumptions, which is uh, the external environment puts, puts pressure on us. So it's, we, we do not work isolated, not because we say that oh, we have a great strategy is going to work. Sometimes it works well and the external environment helps, but sometimes it doesn't help. So we need to be uh, critical that sometimes the external environment pushes us in a negative way. So we have to be rational. We have to think strategically and really critically what are the long-term implications of any decision that we have. So in this case, uh, we're going to look into further units into the five forces model of Michael Porter and how it involves the company, the strategic management. Let's talk about the, the five forces pretty much is our external forces that are going to push us to behave in different ways, right? So in this case, I need to understand how the suppliers that I have are exerting some power into me. For example, if this is a case, for example, of Netflix, no? Netflix says, oh, I have a lot of power. I have the Disney movies until Disney Plus came and said, come, came and said, nope, you cannot use my movies anymore. So if Netflix is out of movie suppliers, they have nothing. And that's something that they thought earlier before. And they said, well, then I have to develop my own movies. And that's something that right, when the Netflix original came, it was a strategic position to understand that perhaps Universal, Disney, or all the major studios were going to pull their movies to their own platforms. And now it's ridiculous because there's five or six platforms and uh, also for the consumer is becoming a hassle to have six pays for six platforms. But anyways, that's an also the reaction of the of the buyers. No, uh, if I have so many options, then what am I gonna take? So competitive rivalry goes together again. In this case, since there's many platforms, um, which one offers the best content and which one is the most efficient and also price wise offers best value. Product substitutes. I can read a book. So in this case also, we have to think in some industries, there are substitute products that also the consumers start to use if they see no value in the product and also potential entrance. In this case, for example, Netflix knew very well that, well, lately he, they, they knew that um, there were potential entrants in this video streaming. YouTube, for example, tried, they, they had already the platform. Right, and they try to to also put the uh, YouTube original movies and stuff, but uh, they, they that was not their core competency. They were not that's not what they were good at. So in the end, they failed, and now most of their content they decided to scrap it or sell it and just don't continue with it. Okay, so anyways, again, that we're gonna see it later more depth into further units. So anyways, in this case, when we think about when we think about the strategic management, we think of the resources. So pretty much the resource-based model of above average return says that we need to understand what resources we have, what are they capable of doing, right? Is it, what are the resources that we have? Uh, what are the capability that we can do it? Here we have it, sorry. <laughs> what we can do with them, the physical resources, human, organizational, we think of, for example, of Google. Google is uh, initially there was the human capital, the one that managed to move them forward because in the end they were the ones who created innovation. So in this case, how were they capable of, 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 of setting those human resources accordingly? And they create a core competency of being an innovator. So they create groups within the company that they became innovators. And that's why you, when you go and look into the Google's strategy for human resources, they treat them like babies. Oh, don't do this, don't do that. I mean, listen, as in, as in just focus on what you have to do. And that's all because in the end, their core competency is the human capital. Okay, well, nowadays, of course, they have that financial capital, which is different. I mean, they use all that financial capital to reinvest in their human resources, but they understand 
all their innovation and technology comes from the human resources. So let's talk about the vision and mission. So in this case, the vision and the mission is, vision is, here I always say, a dream cannot be achieved. That's why you need a goal. And that's the vision. And the mission is the procedure that I'm going to follow or strategy in order to achieve it. So companies usually Large companies have a vision and mission because that's something that they plan to achieve over time. It's a goal, not a wish. And then we have the stakeholders. The companies also need to take care of who are their stakeholders. Um, a stakeholder is just a person that has any interest in the company. Is either because you're the supplier or you are the consumer or you decided to invest in it. So in this case, for example, we have the capital market stakeholders are all those stakeholders and shareholders or the banks that lend you some money, meaning, oh, you want to uh, invest into a larger manufacturing facility. That to me is a good sign that there's more demand. So that's good. If I'm the supplier as a product market stakeholder or a customer, I can think, well, if Tesla has a bigger manufacturing facility, as a supplier, I can supply more things for them. As a customer, I think they might be able to lower the cost of the tools or, or any of the things that I need for my car. So that's a good thing. And the same thing is Tesla is not going to break over the, it's not going to bankrupt over the next 10 years. And then, of course, as employees or organizational stakeholders, is I see future in the company. So, of course, I want to work for a company that, that, that uh, brings better value for us in the future, right? Okay, very good. So, there we have the three of them. And finally, we're going to talk about the strategic leaders. So, strategic leaders, we can think of the CEOs. The work of the CEO is not a single person. They have a team behind that really, uh, really supports their ideal. So usually a CEO is that one who's a able to see those capabilities, groom that people, choose the right ones, and see the best vision for the future. Um, for them, their their work is effective because they can... We have the word, they are visionary. So they really are able to see what's going to happen into the future. And then, of course, they are able to predict where there's the money. Where's the money? So they are able to see where's the money. They elaborate a plan for it and they chase it and they do it. And they use, again, strategic leaders, they use the people around them to really make sure that it happens in the best strategy. Right? So here in the slides, I talked about the work of uh, Bob Eager, the uh, the Disney Disney CEO, which he really made a fantastic work over the last 20 years where he really was able to put Disney, I mean, at, at the company level in a very, very good strategic position. He moved them. He acquired so many assets, financial resources, and many things that secure the future of Disney at least for, for a couple of years. Very good. So with that, we're done for, for, for now. So uh, you, if you have any questions, you can always ask me uh, through the Kakao Talk or um, the Q&A in the eCampus. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next week.